Hello, today is December 18th, 2010. We're meeting today with Mr. Stanley H. Jones at his home in Estes Park, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Stan, and thanks for sitting down to tell your story today. Thank you, Brad. Let's start out, if we could, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you're born, a little bit about your family. Well, I'm an army brat. Very sentimental. Fair enough. Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, no, I was born on February 18th, 1924, which makes me 86, at Fort Benning, Georgia. But on, I, I sometimes say I, I was born in Georgia, but on federal property. Because <laughs> I'm an army brat. Right, okay. And um, I was the third of six children, and um, my first memories are not of at Fort Benning, but of Panama, which was our next station. Wow. Fort Davis, Panama, near Cologne. And from there, if you don't mind, we... Went from Panama to Fort Lewis, Washington, to Columbia, Missouri, to Boonville, Missouri, to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, to Hawaii, where I went to high school. Wow. Uh. And was there when the war started. And um, I wish that I could pop up and get a book right now, but I can't. But let me see. In, it's titled, And I Was There, um, and it was written by an admiral. In the first chapter, he talks of his experience as a young ensign in Hawaii, and then he was, on, on September 2nd, 45, he was on the Missouri as um, Admiral Nimitz's intelligence officer. So he says, I am one of a handful of men. That saw the start of the war and the finish of the war. That's correct. Wow. And I put down his book. I said, me too. Wow. Because I say, we were in Hawaii when the war started. I was wakened by my cat sleeping my, on my feet, who was looking out the window at the bedroom window down toward Wheeler Field. And the bombs were dropping down there and the planes were flying around. I got up and went in to ask Dad if he had any idea what was happening. He was shaving and he said, no, I don't, but go across the alley and talk to Colonel Ackerson, see what he thinks. So at this point, he and you probably thought it was just more of a training exercise, or he, no. he didn't, did he seem concerned? Or? He may have, but I didn't. Yeah. I could see the planes flying around, and I, they don't fly around with big red yeah, yeah. things on them. But I did go over to Ackerson's, and, <clears throat> and Fred Ackerson, my age, and we're still good friends. So he is one. Gosh. Contact that um, from those days that I still have. And that was one of the things that you ask about. Um, but at any rate, it was um, on the way back from the Ackerson's. Uh, what do you call it? Zero. Zero? No. The plane? Well, that. <laughs> <laughs> but a, um, a guard, a man, um, sent around to tell all the officers to report to headquarters, and that really wasn't necessary, but 
I was walking from the Ackersons back over to our house when a zero, oh, when a zero came, if I'd had a long bamboo pole, I probably could have scraped his belly. Is that right? And he was strafing, strafing the 19th Infantry Barracks. My dad was the executive officer of, of the 19th. And you know, I did that didn't scare me until I saw a similar scene in From Here to Eternity. And um, um, then, hey, that, that, that was scary. Wow. Or should have been. And uh, anyhow, um, we, um, by 10 o'clock that morning, we were all up at 19th Infantry Headquarters in a big barracks room and had been told, in fact, as we'd been there the first time, and were told to go home and get clothes and, and uh, get ready to be evacuated. Uh, so that's what, what we did. And we were evacuated that afternoon about five o'clock, taken by an army truck down to, we went to an elementary school and, and um, up in one of the valleys, but that valley, coincidentally, looked right down on Pearl Harbor. Oh. And because we made that trip to school every day, we knew what ships were in and out, and, and we knew which ones had been sunk in the Oklahoma, Nevada, and Utah. And, and um, um, the next morning, though, we were sleeping on the deck of this elementary school, and a plane came up the valley, and we heard the Oh, I don't know why this should be so dang emotion. That's okay. It dropped a bomb just about 200, 200 yards straight down from us, and it made a crater in a Chinaman's garden about six feet across. And don't know where it came from, where it went. Huh. Um, I have an idea ended up in the Kulau Range right behind us. But that was uh, kind of surprising. Yeah. And what's more surprising is that on the 5th of March, the day we were evacuated, I should say the night before, a plane came from somewhere, I got my home theory, and dropped a bomb up in the mountains in the Kulau Range, right behind my high school, which was Roosevelt High School in Honolulu. And um, where it came from, I don't know. But I suspect that a couple of the planes, Japanese planes, on December 7th were disabled and landed on another island and probably got enough fixed them up and, and uh, to the point where they could fly and they were the ones that dropped the bomb. But I, I don't know. Uh, Who else? Hmm. And how else? Can you describe to, uh, to those that will watch this tape uh, what it was like as you looked at, back down the valley at Pearl? What, can you describe the scene as you well, remember it? As I say, you could look right straight down to Pearl, and um, that afternoon, B-17s came in from the mainland, and there was a big, all the anti-aircraft guns at Pearl Harbor started shooting, and again the next morning the same thing happened. Um, they didn't need anything. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, well, we were there until the 5th of March then, from December 7th until the 5th of March, when we were evacuated on the SS Monroe of the President Lines. And it was um, designed to carry 198 passengers. We had more kids under 16 than on, <laughs> more, more than that. But I'll tell you that trip, um, we were evacuated to the Seattle area. Now, was this because there was concern that uh, J Japan was we, going to invade Hawaii? Well, there were all kinds of rumors yeah. that day yeah. Yeah. about the possibility of invasion and over on the Waimanalo side, the wintered side of the island. And uh, um, yes, that was would have been the reason. Now, how was this during this period of time? Uh, was it for you and, and your family? You, you mentioned is that zero flew over. You weren't too concerned about it until you saw the movie later. Was there any? Did did fear ever? Did you ever develop fear, or what? Were, no, what were you thinking? To, not until I saw the, the movie from here to from here to eternity. But with that period of time and with the rumors flying, what was going through your mind? What were you thinking? Uh, you remember? Uh, was it? Well. First, there was no question in my mind but what these were Japanese planes and mm -hmm. that we were being attacked. Mm -hmm. And this was 20 minutes before Pearl Harbor was hit. Uh, now, Wheeler Field, which was an Army air base, um, that's about a mile to the Pearl Harbor side of where we were. and. Um, Gosh, it's been a long time since yeah. I told this, and I've only told it half a dozen. But obviously, it was one of the standout days in my memory. I was a senior in high school. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sure. And um, the short of turning eighteen, right? Uh, you. Yeah, a couple yeah. months short of 18. Let's see, 24 to 24 to 41. Uh, uh, yeah, 17. So a couple months later, February, you would have been turned 18. So oh, yeah. that's right. Now, were uh, all six of you kids there, or uh, uh, were some of the older ones gone? No, or? my sister was married to an Air Force career officer, and they were at Hickam Field. Oh, geez. And their quarters were about midway between. The line at Hickam Field and the the sub pens at Pearl Harbor, and we later picked shrapnel and stuff out of their roof. And Phyllis said that Dave, they sat under the dining <laughs> dining room table, and Dave had forty five. <laughs> what, what are you going to do with it? Who knows? Yeah. Um, and then she was evacuated. Uh, back to the States, his parents lived in St. Louis, and she went back and stayed with them, but she was evacuated on Christmas Day. And um, on Christmas Day, that was quite a, an experience, too. Mom would pull something out of a bag, this is, this is for you. <laughs> we didn't see those things until we were in Wichita uh, months later. Um, where are we? So uh, we got to the point where you, you guys were getting all evacuated back to the States. Now, I, 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 I take it your there, father, you had to leave your father behind. Oh, yes. And what was, was that uh, like? He, a, was, he was in Hawaii until the following August when he came back for a short time and was assigned at Fort McClellan, Alabama. And... Um, Dad was an expert at training, and you know, Fort McClellan was a training post, and that was where I started my Army career. In fact, Dad got me assigned to his regiment, and the commanding general found out about that, and he, no way. <laughs> and Dad wanted to use me as sort of liaison to 
let you tell him how the training was going from the GI point of view. But the commanding general found out about that and he said, nope, um, that's not going to work. And so I was assigned to another regiment. Now, was it your plans uh, prior to Pearl that once you graduated that you would go into the service or did, did that prompt you to go? I, um, I don't know how no. that figured in. I probably figured that if it was the war, I'd have to go in. Yeah. And I was drafted uh, October 1943. That's not right. Yes, that's right. And that was after I'd, I'd missed out on a whole semester of school. So I took another whole year of high school at Wichita East. And we went to Wichita because my father's mother and my mother's father were still living in Sedgwick County, okay. which is where Wichita is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it just seemed like a quiet, safe place to go. Right. So that last semester of your high school, the chaos of being transferred back to the States and moved around, you, you lost out on, on school. Yeah. Okay. That's right. The, there was no school for anybody until the following April, I, I understand. And, of course, we didn't get involved in that. But I've been very close with that high school class. Is that right? We hosted a high school class reunion here in Estes Park and had 45, Carolyn? We had 45. 50 and, total. From, yeah. But the um, majority was, were from Hawaii. But... Um, and the day they arrived, it snowed. Oh boy. September twenty third, <laughs> and they just went wild. <laughs> yeah, that was, but at any rate, um, it, we've been a very close class since then. And as Carol mentioned, we had forty five from that class here for a reunion, mm. and um, um, but that's that's another story. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, so, so you. We'll get back to your uh, in basic down at Fort McClellan. Was that? Uh, mm -hmm. And take your story from well, there. I was finally drafted after. Well, I took a after I graduated from high school. Finally, after the year or semester off, then I took another whole year, and and then that summer I went to Wichita U for uh, just took a course and. And um, freshman comp and in college algebra. And I'll tell you, those two courses on my record opened a lot of doors for me in the service, especially because I got A's in both of them. <laughs> um, okay, so we're, we were evacuated on the 5th of, of, of March. Came back on the Monroe, a beautiful ship, and had a whole bunch of kids my age. And we, every night, we sat out in the deck. And there were two, two uh, students from Notre Dame. And we sat out until 2 and 3 in the morning and sang. Oh, wow. Oh, it was great. Um, well, where are we going? Well, okay, so uh, we'll we'll move ahead. Then you you took that those courses at Wichita State, and then and then you, is that when you got drafted? Uh, then no, I didn't get drafted until October nineteenth, forty three. That was when I went into the service um, from Fort McClellan, and. Everybody that I was drafted with went to the Navy, but I said, I want to go to the Army. So they gave me another mental test, and, <laughs> and then I was, uh, oh, oh, didn't make any difference. Um, did a few days at, in Atlanta, and then back to Fort McClellan, and I told part of that story. Mm -hmm. But being an army brat, I was sort of ahead of the game. And when we 
graduated from um, basic training, had a graduation parade, and you can guess who was the battalion commander. Sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, from Fort McClellan, I stayed on as cadre there for a time and had decided previously that I wanted to go into the paratroops. Oh. Why? Very simple. Because when my grandchildren asked what I did in the Great War, I wouldn't be embarrassed. <laughs> my grandchildren never asked. <laughs> I don't think they know there was a war. Yeah. So, um, but at any rate, that's why I went to the paratroops. And um, when I eventually, when I was sent overseas to the Philippines to join the 11th Airborne Division, it took us 26 days to across the Pacific, and somebody goaded me into a smoking a cigar. I've never smoked, but I smoked that cigar, and on the calm Pacific, I was sicker than a dog for three days. <laughs> so I've never smoked. My, my father, incidentally, uh, dad, uh, bet me a Five dollars within a year after I was in the service that I'd be smoking. Well, if I could win five dollars that easily from my father, I was going to do it, so I never did. And the last time I saw him alive, he took me to lunch, and I reminded him of that bet. <laughs> and I figured that he spent about five dollars for lunch. So yeah. <laughs> We're even. even. <laughs> well, I'd like to back up a little All bit right. uh, and talk about uh, uh, your airborne experience because that was that was a pretty elite and hard uh, yes, thing to is. get into. Uh, well, how talk a little bit about that training and and getting into the program and the training was very specific and thorough. Oh, as a paratrooper, uh, you uh, we ran through two weeks before we made uh, an actual jump. And um, um, I'm trying to think what all was involved in that training other than running. It seemed that that was about all we did was run. But quite a few people washed out of that program, didn't it? It was, uh, oh, it was yeah. a pretty tough, yeah. from what I understand. But um, I didn't have any real problem with, with it. I was, a, I was a born soldier. And being an army brat, I mm -hmm. guess that's somewhat to be expected. But I was a good soldier. And um, at some point, um, I don't know how it happened, but was asked if I would be interested in going to officer's candidate school, which was my intention from the start, and we did. Is so, that where, once again, your those college courses play, help play into yeah, that? Yeah, that probably did there, but I was thinking more of later on. Okay. So back to Fort Benning we go. Uh, to uh, take, go through jump school. And I took uh, jump master's training in uh, school. And any school that I could. I wasn't eager to go overseas and get shot at. And, in fact, that is a, a very critical statement. I am not a combat veteran. Um, Got over there just after, was assigned to the 11th Airborne Division, just after they came off of Tagatai Ridge in, on Luzon. 
Now I joined them at Lipa, um, Laguna de Bay, and um, was assigned to A Company of the 187th Regiment of the 11th Airborne Division, was a platoon commander. And at that point, the division, the war suddenly came to a, an abrupt atomic halt. And um, we began training for the invasion of Japan. Didn't expect that that would be a lot of fun. Right, certainly. And so I attribute the fact that I'm sitting here talking to you to the fact that the atomic bomb was dropped and the, the two of them, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and the war was over. That's one question I always uh, yep. usually ask is, uh, I know there's always been that controversy as to whether we should have dropped them or not, but I think you just gave me your answer to it. I mean, I wouldn't be asking you this question more than likely because the Japanese will understand would have fought to the, to the bitter end. It would have uh, it would have been a bloodbath if you guys would have invaded. Yes. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. And <clears throat> we didn't want that, and apparently somebody decided they didn't want it. Now, now, when you first heard about these bombs, could you imagine what this, these things did? Uh, Not did? really. Yeah. It was because they were of such immense proportion, we had nothing to relate it to. Yeah, right, sure. And, um, oh, but I understood that the war was brought to an end because of them, and consequently I attribute the dropping of a bombs um, as the thing that saved my life because right. had we had to go in and, and invade Japan I wouldn't have given two cents for my odds for the odds right yeah that would come out alive. yeah you you wouldn't have been one of the fifth or sixth waves going in you would have been the first wave going oh, in behind way behind yes. enemy lines with as a paratrooper uh, uh, I think that is uh, very definitely the case. Had you uh, had the plans developed further enough along where you would have known where you guys were were set to, uh, or what your your part in the invasion was? Had we, as you say, we would have been dropped in first, and, and um, the way they did D Day in Normandy, right? The uh, 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions. Um, but where, just where, and I, I, I wish I had a map of yeah. Japan yeah. here now. What, what's, what's the island south of Honshu? That probably is where okay. we'd have been dropped. Okay. Um, but we weren't. Yeah, right, right. Now, was there when you guys got word of the, the bombs and the and the eventual surrender? Was there quite a quite a, a party and celebration? With no, no, yeah. no, because the war was still going on. We didn't know, know that that was going to end it, and we were still preparing to invade Japan. Joseph Swing, Major General, Division Commander. The regimental commander was a colonel by the name of Pearson, and there was another Pearson in our an officer in our regiment. But later I became a company commander, and I think it's interesting to note that the other four battalion, other four company commanders in the, in the battalion, Lyman S. Faulkner was a class of 43, I think, and the other three company commanders, not counting me, were all, all out of the class of 45. So I was in pretty elite company. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all West Pointers. <laughs> I have a brother who graduated in 44. Louis was a 
B-29 pilot. Mm. And his squadron was mapping the Marianas, and he was killed. Oh, boy. Plane crashed off the north end of Guam. And I'd seen him a month and three days before. Yeah, I was just going to ask if you guys had run into each other over there. Oh, oh boy. Had a deuce of a time finding him. But I finally did. About 3.30 in the morning. Yeah, how did that, tell how that story came together, how you, how you managed to find him. And... Well, I... <clears throat> had been made a, an official courier, which sort of teed me off to start with, but on the other hand, it gave me the opportunity to commandeer a, a jeep and a driver. <laughs> and uh, we hunted all over that island. Louis had moved from one spot to another, and I hadn't gotten word of it. But when I finally did find him, and as I say, it was very early in the morning, instead of having five hours with him, I ended up with an hour. Oh, wow. I found him. I put my hand on his shoulder. He was asleep. You ready? Oh, yeah. He rolled over and he said, Stan. So we had only about an hour together. And he told, wrote the folks and said that when I left at about 5.30 in the morning, he felt like he was the only person left in the Pacific. Oh, wow. Wow. Dad had been down in the Philippines. And I'm not sure what he was doing, I don't recall, and it didn't make any difference, but we tried to get together and I could have gotten down, but I couldn't have, couldn't have gotten back. Um, I went to 8th Army headquarters and pleaded my case, but there was no way, as I say, that they could get me back to Japan. Oh, so this was part, you were in the occupation force at the, forces uh, at this time? Well, the occupation had started on September 2nd, and uh, that was part of my story about being there at the start. Right, the right, finish, yeah, and we'll get to that, of course. We were, yeah. we were just 15 miles away from the Missouri. So, so let's back up a little bit yeah. then. So uh, the atomic bombs are dropped, uh, uh, VJ days announced, and then from there you, your unit was then moved up to Japan as part of the occupation force? Or yeah. Take your story from there. We went into Japan on the first day of the occupation on the 2nd of September 45, and the mission of our regiment was to secure, secure the Atsugi air base for MacArthur's arrival. And he landed. I saw him then and I saw him once later on. That's another story. Okay. <laughs> but um, we were, as I say, just 15 miles from, from the Missouri and Tokyo Bay. And um, we set up camp there at Atsugi Air Base. And it was an interesting period of time because we would send out patrols out in the local area. And the native population, when they'd see us, any one of our patrols coming, they'd turn around and run off. They didn't want to face us. And that even later, short time later when we were going in into Tokyo, the native population would turn their backs uh, on the Americans. 
in, a, in a defiant sort of way, or were they ashamed, or what, how do you, what uh, do you think? Uh... I don't know how to describe it. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't a belligerent sort of thing. It was a, um, it was just what they did. They yeah. did not want to face us. Yeah. And that changed in time. But there was no worries initially as far as uh, guerrilla attacks or any uh, continued uh, uh, oh, no. war, warfare. They, they pretty much, as soon as they dropped their arms. And, that was it. Yeah, okay. And um, the, the patrols we, we sent out in the local area were not greeted warmly. They didn't yeah. Was, yeah. <laughs> Conquering heroes or right. anything like that. They they just didn't want anything to do with us just at the start. But that that all changed. And, um, later we had two house girls uh, that took care of my wife and and my oldest daughter who was just here last mm -hmm. week. <clears throat> my middle daughter was the second baby born in the occupation. So let's back up. So now, when did you when did you marry? We we got to introduce the marriage and family. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. When did I get married? Right after I graduated from Officer Candidate School. I graduated on the twentieth. Went from from um, Fort Benning up to. Dayton, Ohio, and uh, was married on the 23rd. Now, is this a local guy you'd met? This is, no, 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 no. Um, we'd gone to high school together that year after I got back from Japan. Down in Wichita? Am I getting confused? If I am... I apologize, but I'm 86. Oh, well, fair enough. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> I get means. to do that. Yeah, there, yeah. I'm going well on 87. You got your, uh, you got that right. You bet. Um, a month from today, you'll be 87. What? A month from today, you will be 87. Yeah. But. Um, When was I married? Three days after I graduated from Officer's Candidate School in Dayton, Ohio. That much I know. And so you took your OCS up in, in Dayton? Yes. My wife's my first wife's family were all in Dayton. And um, she's no longer living. Mm -hmm. Carolyn and I have been married for 24 years, and they've been good years. Yeah. And we hope to take some kind of a, a 25th anniversary trip. We talked about going to Panama, one of my first memories. Right, were. right. I don't know that we'll do that. I don't know what we'll do. Yeah, yeah. But so you went over. Uh, uh, so you went overseas after you were married. Then you left uh, your your family behind. Yes, uh, certainly you... did. And in fact, the Red Cross. I finally found out six weeks after my first daughter was born that I had a daughter. Wow! Uh, just because of the the, oh, the it, rate of know, communications and how slow it was. Communication was not like they were yeah, art. Yeah. Right. Age. Yeah. And uh, but it was that long before I even found out I had a daughter. And then how much longer after that before you actually were able to hold her and meet her? I got home on a six week TDY R and R and rest and recreation. Mm -hmm. And um, um, that was when I first met my daughter. And that would have been, oh golly, a 
you know, tie the tie. Yeah. The time now, no. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's that important. So then, eventually, your family joined you back in Japan. Yes, then. then they came to Japan. Followed me. That's what it amounted to. And I got back up to Hokkaido and got a phone call from somebody from down below and said that I had a very teary eyed wife and with a beautiful baby down here hunting for you. <laughs> well, I didn't know they followed that soon. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Um, but they did. Speaking of, while we're kind of on the on communications, how was that as far as uh, uh, writing back and forth, both to your folks and, and to your uh, your wife, maybe to some of your siblings, uh, and with you moving around and such, was mail? How was mail getting back and forth? Hello. And, and you were using prim primarily V mail and. Um, no, it was snail mail. Yeah. And uh, that was a, a true description of it. Because it took many days for letters to get home. And you know, I, that raises something that um, bothered me then and bothers me even more. When I came back, we used to write every day. So when I got home after over 13 months, well, there was quite a pack of letters, and um, I looked out from the deck, the back deck, and my first wife was standing there pitching all those letters into a burner. And that was my life, my, my history, my history, right. yeah, and, and right. that really bothered me. Carol, I don't, I'm sure, would not have done that. Yeah, yeah. But that's what happened. Yeah, yeah. And I have no control over sure. those things. They're long gone. Um, so where do you want to go? Okay, so we'll go back to the occupation there. So you guys land, you secure the base. Uh, then MacArthur flies in. You said you met him for the first time or saw him for the first time. I saw there? him for the yeah. first time. Yeah. He did not come up and... Yeah. Oh, you're Lieutenant Jones. Uh, yeah. Pleased to meet. No, he didn't do that. <laughs> the next time I met him, or saw him, was I had a friend who was a uh, custodian of the Daiichi Building, which was where MacArthur's headquarters were, where his headquarters were, and I went to see him. He'd been in our regiment, and then. He t took that job as a civilian job out of the service. And I'd been to see him and left and was going to leave the Daiichi building. And here came Doug out, Doug himself, <laughs> coming in. And I was having a deuce of a time holding the door open and highballing at the same time. <laughs> but that, those were the two times I uh, ran into him. To Douglas MacArthur, um, but he, as I say, he didn't know me from yeah. Yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah. How long altogether were you there uh, then in Japan as part of the occupation Three force? Three and a half years. Three and a half years, by choice or just because you just simply yeah. didn't have enough points or uh, to go I home? I had plenty of points. I could come home at any time, but I decided that that was a unique opportunity. But you know, unique opportunity, but there was only one officer in the regiment, and that was Poopy Connor, Lieutenant Colonel Poopy Connor, the executive officer, who actually took and studied Japanese. We all you pick up, up phrases, mm -hmm. but um, I certainly didn't do it. Maybe we all should have done it. Maybe it should have been required, but we didn't. 
and my entire time, I first went to Sendai up the east coast in Honshu. I was up there until February. Then in February, we went on north to Hokkaido. We got to Hokkaido and there was three feet of snow on us. More than that, there was six feet of snow on the ground. And uh, oh, Hokkaido was pretty, that was the way Hokkaido was. But it was an interesting deployment. Um, ultimately, I ended up taking a, a company patrol out to the east, most easterly point, the Nemuro Peninsula. And it was six miles across to the uh, Russian occupied oh, wow. islands. And you could see their laundry uh, hanging uh -huh. up. Um, and that was one of the highlights of so the trip out to the east point of Hokkaido. I said Nemuro Peninsula, and I think that's right. Where's my map of Japan? Yeah, fair it doesn't enough. make any yeah. difference. Yeah. The eastern, most easterly point of Hokkaido. And I felt honored to uh, have taken that company patrol out there. Um, I was the only officer in my company for almost the entire time. Had a young West Pointer out of the class of 45 that was assigned to me for a short time. And uh, he was a, a fine officer, was killed in, in um, Korea. Korea. I guess. Mm -hmm. And I had another officer, Lieutenant Miller, who actually outranked me. But I had him for three days, and we made a jump, and he broke his neck. Ooh. How? I don't know. Sprained an ankle, yes, but broken neck? So I had him for three days. And I don't want to say it was a good thing he did, but I would have lost the company to him yeah. because he outranked me. Yeah, right. Right. So you guys were still jumping, uh, still periodically jumping? Oh, sure. Oh, okay. We call them pay jumps. You had to jump periodically to get your jump pay. Gotcha. Okay. And um, so we we did. We we made those periodic pay jumps. I don't remember what it was. Every six months, I think. But we jumped more frequently than that. I had a total of uh, 20 more land or takeoffs than I had landings. In other words, I jumped 20 times. Yes, yeah, yeah. Do you remember that very first jump oh, back in training? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> the first three jumps were kind of like that. It took three jumps before I was able to realize what I was doing, whether or not yeah. I had my hands on my reserve shoot the way you're supposed to and went out the plane properly. And, I wrote up each one of those 20 jumps. And after the third one, it, it became more routine. Mm, mm. If a parachute jump ever becomes routine, but it did. And, uh, but the first, first three jumps, especially that first one, um, there was a lot of extra going to the men's room <laughs> prior to the jump. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we had excellent training. It was just superb. So that by the time we jumped, it was almost old hat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I imagine some of this Carolyn has never heard before, uh, right? Right. Yeah. Okay, so where do you want to go? So uh, back in uh, you're back in Japan in the occupation force. So over time, uh, interaction with the with the locals and the, the Japanese became more routine. And oh, how was that like uh, dealing with the, the, the local native po or the civilian population? Um, 
There were things you could and couldn't do. We weren't allowed to eat any of their food. Because, I presume, because it was needed by them. Yeah, okay, right. And I think that's a logical assumption. And that's another question. To add to this, can you describe uh, conditions there uh, as you saw in the, pe- you, the people? It sounds like they were starving. and, and No, I don't think they were. Um, we eventually, after my wife got over there, my wife and first child, and the second child was born. I think I mentioned mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. Second baby born in the occupation. But... Um, um, there, as I saw it, there was plenty to eat, and we certainly had plenty. Mm-hmm, right. However, there were times when we lived on sea rations, the canned stuff, and K rations, the cardboard wrapped stuff, uh, for periods of time, and uh, we had an officer's mess at one point had a cook that just did wonders with K rations. We'd pull them and he'd make all sorts of uh, gourmet uh, dishes with our K rations. And if you've ever had K rations, you'd say, that's not possible. <laughs> and he did. So. Now, during uh, when you were uh, on, weren't on duty and such. Did you get the opportunity to kind of travel around and sightsee in Japan at all, or were you primarily stationed at your um, at your bases, uh, the various places you were stationed? Did not do too much sightseeing. I eventually got down to the Tokyo area uh, for the second time, and. Um, I got to do some sightseeing. As I say, I had a friend who was custodian of the mm-hmm. Daiichi building, and, mm-hmm. and through him we saw some things. But as far as touring around, no. I don't recall that it did little, if any, of that. Upon Hokkaido, I saw, pretty well saw the island of Hokkaido, mm. one way or another, most on official business. We supervised the first elections that were held in Japan, and with a sergeant, I was assigned to the town of Rumoi, R-U-M-O-I, on the west coast. And um, oh, that was a good opportunity to see the native population. And although we saw a good bit of them, you know, different times. It's hard to remember just sure. the sequence of events. Oh, sure. Fair enough. But I do remember that. Um, and. Um, that trip out to the East Point, I remember very definitely. And took another trip that was sort of a fiasco trip. And, and went up to a lake, the whole, the whole company, my, my company, 187 men. I was one officer when there should have been six. Wow. And sent part of the, we were at a, a train. And that train was going to meet us up at the end of the line. Well, I sent one platoon down to meet the, the train. And uh, um, I don't know, it got followed up some way. I don't remember how that was. We had a, a Japanese guide and communication was not that great. But we ended up, all of us, going back to point of beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm telling something of my um, frailties now, I guess. <laughs> So you had mentioned earlier, your daughter was the second child born? Born in the occupation. I'll be darned. And um, she, well, there's a cloisonne vase up there. Anything, there are two carved bears carved by the Ainu Indians. That's A-I-N-U Indians of uh, Japan. But anything from Japan she will get those two bears and that cloisonne vase. That cloisonne ash tree. I use it for catch-all. Yeah. I don't remember all else there is from Japan. Not an awful lot. Yeah. yeah. The, um, the um, bayonets and other Japanese artifacts that I had, I got rid of a long time ago. Yeah. Somebody who collected stuff like that. And I didn't particularly want them. <gasps> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, being one of the first families to come over, was it hard to find accommodations uh, for your wife and daughter and, and yourself? Or? We lived for three months in the Grand Hotel in Sapporo. Had an apartment there. And then, um, as housing developed on the base uh, at our post, Camp Schimmelfennig, don't ask me to spell it, <laughs> um, you, are you, we limited in time? or no, Just making sure she's still running. <laughs> um, we eventually got uh, quarters that were built by the Japanese and um, they were not the highest quality of construction. I remember I lived through the wall with a Lieutenant Gledford E. Gledford e. Davis who has since died. And when we were shaving in the morning, we could talk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but they were good snow shovelers. I, I have some movies uh, that I took. And one of them I recall, uh, Japanese National clearing the sidewalk and the snow was uh, four feet deep. And he had a very precise way of clearing that snow, oh, coming out in blocks. Uh, but then following that in the movie is a um, sort of an army s snow plow, you know, shooting the, clearing the runway at Shatosi. And Chitosi reminds me of another experience. I was the officer of the guard, and um, Sergeant Lagarde came into where I was, and he said, Sir, the prisoners refuse to get up. Oh, they do. Well, I went into the, where the prisoners were housed. And I started turning over um, bunks, just flipping them over, and told them that they had X number of minutes to be dressed and out. Because we were going to take a little walk, a little hike. And boy, we, we started out 26 miles to Shitosi. And we started out on the double. A jeep with a guard, a weapon. I did not have a weapon at any time in involvement. We started out towards Shitosi, and they were slow in becoming soldiers. 
So we started jogging. And of course, paratroopers jogged. That was their thing. Yeah. Jumping out of airplanes and jogging. And I said, when you're ready to act like soldiers and march, maybe we'll turn around and head back. I don't know how many miles we went, but it was a good five before we finally turned around and headed back to the base. I was not easy. Um, but that was just one example of the way I dealt with bad situations. I hope no former commander is <laughs> I don't think I'm subject to court martial anyhow. Yeah. No. Um, where were we? Where do you want well, to is there anything else that left as part of your time in Japan before we move on to the rest of your story? Any stories that I had left out or any questions I didn't ask you or stories you other memories of Japan you wanted to add to this before we move on to the order of... Uh, I remember a soldier by the name of Dawson who was tried for murder. And I was the assistant trial judge advocate mm. on that trial. And later, I decided he wasn't such a bad guy. And I actually left him for a brief time in the apartment with my wife and baby. Is that right? Wow. I had decided he was a decent human being. And I think that uh, his sentence was commuted. He was not, uh, he was sentenced to die. I think his sentence was commuted by Truman, which was just one of the good thing, another of the good things that Truman did. <laughs> um, uh, I, with a little thought, I could sure. tell all kinds of stuff that happened in Japan. But that's, you got the general idea. Right, right, just, right. Now, with your leaving Japan, was that uh, were you transferred, or were you getting out of the service, or what prompted your your leave from uh, from Japan then? We did not fly. We came back by ship to Seattle, and I was quote separated from the service on the 10th of May, uh, 48. Uh, officers were not discharged, I guess. Mm. They were separated. So you really, you had no thought of becoming a career officer like your father? Was that... Uh... Well, I remember a walk to, to leave, was walking with the assistant division commander General Miley, and he asked just that question. You have all this wonderful experience, why don't you stay in the service? And I said, General Miley, I have a high school education and two courses in college. And he said, yes, but you have all this wonderful experience. I said, well, if you don't need a college education, why do you send women, men to West Point for four years? End of conversation. <laughs> Too late to try me for insubordination. <laughs> but that's what I ask our division, assistant division commander. And he didn't have a good answer for it. I think he thought, well, that's a good point. Yeah. And at that time, I had a brother 
My brother was still at West Point. Louis was a B-29 pilot and went into the drink just north of Guam on the 11th of June. Just a month and three days after I'd seen him. Right, right. Oh, boy. His his loss to the family was incalculable. It was just mom was in Orlando, Florida. Dad had just been there. I had just been there. We'd both gone back to our assignments. When Um, yep. Oh boy. <clears throat> so she was all by herself. Oh wow. And she said she did something that <sighs> she hadn't done since she was a little girl. She knelt by her bed, prayed, hmm. bless her heart. Wow, that yeah, must, must have been tough. Now with you guys spread all over the world, was there ever a chance to have a, 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 a service for him or a memorial for him or how would, were they able to recover his, his body? From, oh no. No? Uh, no. I spoke to his squadron commander and he said that it looked like Louis was out know, over the north end of Guam, was trying to bring the plane around and come back. So apparently something was the matter and he knew it, but he didn't make it. Yeah. The whole crew was lost? Yeah. Oh, boy. Hmm. Thirteen men. And Mom called me and told me about it. She said, you'll see it in the paper. And the next day in the paper, thirteen men lost in B-29 crash. Hmm. Well, he was a great guy. He had his frailties, but yeah, yeah. he was a good older brother. And the girl that he had hoped to marry was still in close contact. Is yes, that right? Wow. She, uh, her husband recently died. She married the son of Lawton J. Collins. Oh. And they had a good marriage. And I've talked to Caroline about that. And after Jerry died, she moved back to Lewiston, Idaho, in the old big old family house. And she says, I'm just going to wrap that house around me and live out my life here. Mm. I hope someday we can. Go see Caroline. We Carol. did it. We did once. What? We did once in that big house. We did visit her once in that big house. Yes. And right, right here on the counter is a Christmas card addressed to her. Wow. Yeah. So once, okay, so we'll move ahead with your story then. Once you guys, uh, uh, you're transferred back to, to the States and you're separated uh, from the service, Take your story from there. Where'd you guys go from there and what'd you do? GI Bill. And I took full advantage of it. I went up to Colorado State, then Colorado A&M, and got a bachelor's degree in forest utilization. 
Now, how did you come to choose Colorado State? Because of the forest program, or well, the folks lived down in Denver. Oh, they were okay. That was part of it. Okay, I never lived there. Yeah. It was your father at this point retired from the service, or was he still no, not his quite. station? Okay. No, he still served another year or so. <clears throat> but um, I went to Colorado State. Graduated in '52. And um, was I placed fifteenth in the nation in uh, what did they call it? People who were um, trying to get into into the Forest Service. Okay. Uh huh. And um, was to have been assigned out. Uh, in Idaho. The forest supervisor's name was Doherty. And I stopped to see him on my way to Seattle. And he said, well, Stan, if you decide that higher education is not for you, come on back. You've got a job here with the Forest Service. And I had no intention of going to that district. If you'll apologize, if you'll forgive my landing or my language, but that was what we called a cow shit and condom <laughs> district. <laughs> Range and recreation. <laughs> and that wasn't what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to get a, a master's in forest management. Um, at the University of Washington, which is what I did. And for three day, three years after I got my master's degree, I actually served as a forester. Ah. And uh, uh, then, where was I? Out of, oh, I know, after I got my master's degree, the dean said, now Stan, I presume you want a job. I said, yes, that would be nice, because <laughs> I had three kids. He said, well, you go down to the forestry department warehouser in the Tacoma building in Tacoma and see Don McKay. And apparently he'd already called Don when I got down there, but Don gave me a, a job. I started to work with the forestry department to, for Weyerhaeuser, and I, I did that for three years before I decided to, to go through sales training and um, worked in the mill at Longview, Washington for almost a year and spent three months at Potlatch in Lewiston, Idaho. And um, then I went back, got a sales job with Weyerhaeuser, started out in St. Paul, was there for just three months, and was sent down to um, Oh, gosh. Central Indiana. And that was where I served the rest of my 10 years with Weyerhaeuser, I guess. No? Because eventually I went down to Cincinnati as a regional manager. And um, I had two men under me. After 187, yeah. two was a cinch. Yeah. <laughs> Made one of the biggest mistakes of my professional life 
when uh, when I was going to leave where I was with these two two men, I wrote a an assessment of their potential capability with Warehouser. Gross, gross mistake. Because one of those guys, and I wasn't very complimentary about either of them, but one of them, KKS was his name, went shot right up the ladder. Hmm. I'm glad for him. Yeah. Sorry for me. Yeah. <laughs> so I was not the world's best judge of of, um, of personnel. I don't know that I ever made another mistake like that, but that that was so bad. Hmm. I don't know whether Kay ever forgave me or not. I've seen him once since then. All right, now where do you want to so, go? So uh, you spent then 10 years with Weyerhaeuser? Or A total of 10. 10, and then where did you go? Did you retire after that? Or no, you... no, no, yeah. no, no. Um, a um, wholesale lumber outfit in Dayton. Good night, I can't even think who that was. Warned me. I'd, I'd known him because my contacts. Um, they got to know me, mm -hmm. and um, they asked me to come to work for them, and I did. And that just did not work out. Hello, today is December 18th, 2010. We're meeting today with Mr. Stanley H. Jones at his home in Estes Park, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Stan, and thanks for sitting down to tell your story today. Thank you, Brad. Let's start out, if we could, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you're born, a little bit about your family. Well, I'm an army brat. Very sentimental. Fair enough. Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, no, I was born on February 18th, 1924, which makes me 86, at Fort Benning, Georgia. But on, I, I sometimes say I, I was born in Georgia, but on federal property. Because <laughs> I'm an army brat. Right, okay. And um, I was the third of six children, and um, my first memories are not of at Fort Benning, but of Panama, which was our next station. Wow. Fort Davis, Panama, near Cologne. And from there, if you don't mind, we went from Panama to Fort Lewis, Washington, to Columbia, Missouri, to Boonville, Missouri, to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, to Hawaii, where I went to high school. Wow. Uh. And was there when the war started. And um, I wish that I could pop up and get a book right now, but I can't. But let me see. In, it's titled, And I Was There, um, and it was written by an admiral. In the first chapter, he talks of his experience as a young ensign in Hawaii, and then he was on, on September 2nd, 45, he was on the Missouri as um, Admiral Nimitz's intelligence officer 
So he says, I am one of a handful of men. That saw the start of the war and the finish of the war. That's correct. Wow. And I put down his book. I said, me too. Wow. Because I say, we were in Hawaii when the war started. I was wakened by my cat, sleeping with my, on my feet. Who was looking out the window, at the bedroom window, down toward Wheeler Field. And the bombs were dropping down there, and planes were flying around. I got up and went in to ask Dad if he had any idea what was happening. He was shaving, and he said, no, I don't, but go across the alley and talk to Colonel Ackerson. See what he thinks. So at this point, he and you probably thought it was just more of a training exercise, or he, no. he didn't. Did he seem concerned? Or? He may have, but I didn't. Yeah, I could see the planes flying around, and I, they don't fly around with big red. Yeah, yeah. Things on them, but I did go over to Ackerson's, and <clears throat> and Fred Ackerson, my age, and we're still good friends. So he is one, gosh, contact that um, from those days that I still have. And that was one of the things that you ask about. Um, but at any rate, it was um, on the way back from Ackerson's. Uh, right behind us, but that was uh, kind of surprising. Yeah. And what's more surprising is that on the 5th of March, the day we were evacuated, I should say the night before, a plane came from somewhere, I got my home theory, and dropped a bomb up in the mountains in the Kulau Range, right behind my high school, which was Roosevelt High School in Honolulu. And um, where it came from, I don't know. But I suspect that a couple of the planes, Japanese planes, on December 7th were disabled and landed on another island and probably got enough fixed them up and, and uh, to the point where they could fly and they were the ones that dropped the bombs. I, I don't know. Ah, Who else? Hmm. And how else? Can you describe to, uh, to those that will watch this tape uh, what it was like as you looked at, back down the valley at Pearl? What, can you describe the scene as well, you remember it? As I say, you could look right straight down to Pearl, and um, that afternoon, B-17s came in from the mainland, and there was a big, all the anti-aircraft guns at Pearl Harbor started shooting, and again the next morning the same thing happened. Um, they didn't hit anything. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, we were there until the 5th of March then, from December 7th until the 5th of March, when we were evacuated on the SS Monroe of the President Lines. And it was um, designed to carry 198 passengers. We had more kids under 16 and on, <laughs> more, more than that. But I'll tell you that trip, um, we were evacuated to the Seattle area. Now, was this because there was concern that uh, J Japan was we, going to invade Hawaii? Well, there were all kinds of rumors yeah. that day yeah. Yeah. about the possibility of invasion and over on the Waimanalo side, the wintered side of the island. And... Um, um, 
Yes, that was would have been the reason. Now, how was this during this period of time? Uh, was it for you and, and your family? You, you mentioned is that zero flew over. You weren't too concerned about it until you saw the movie later. Was there any did did fear ever? Did you ever develop fear, or what? Were, no, what were you thinking? I'd say to, not until I saw the, the movie from here to from here to eternity. But with that period of time and with the rumors flying, what was going through your mind? What were you thinking? Uh, do you remember? Uh, was it? Well. First, there was no question in my mind but what these were Japanese planes and mm -hmm. that we were being attacked. Mm -hmm. And this was 20 minutes before Pearl Harbor was hit. Uh, now, Wheeler Field, which was an Army air base, um, that's about a mile to the Pearl Harbor side of where we were. and. Um, Gosh, it's been a long time since yeah. I've told this. And I've only told it half a dozen. But obviously it was one of the standout days in my memory. I was a senior in high school. Right, okay, yeah, sure. And... Um, Just short of turning 18, right? Uh, you. No, a couple no, months short of 18? Let's see, 24 to, 24 to 41, uh, that's... Yeah, 17, so a couple months later, February, you would have been turned 18, so... No, yeah. That's right. Now, were uh, all six of you kids there, or uh, uh, were some of the older ones gone? No, or? my sister was married to an Air Force career officer, and they were at Hickam Field. Oh, jeez. And their quarters were about midway between the line at Hickam Field and the, the sub-pens at Pearl Harbor. And we later picked shrapnel and stuff out of their roof. And Phyllis said that Dave, they sat under the dining, <laughs> dining room table and Dave had 45. <laughs> what, are you, what are you gonna do with it, who knows? Yeah. Um, and then she was evacuated uh, back to the States, his parents lived in St. Louis, and she went back and stayed with them, but she was evacuated on Christmas Day. And um, on Christmas Day, that was quite a, an experience, too. Mom would pull something out of a bag. This is, this is for you. <laughs> we didn't see those things until we were in Wichita a month later. Um, where are we? So uh, we got to the point where you, you guys were getting all evacuated back to the States. I, 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 I take it your, your father, you had to leave your father behind. Oh, yes. He what was, was that uh, like? He a, was he was in Hawaii until the following August when he came back for a short time and was assigned at Fort McClellan, Alabama. And... Um, Dad was an expert at training, and you know, Fort McClellan was a training post, and that was where I started my Army career. In fact, Dad got me assigned to his regiment, and the commanding general found out about that, and he, no way, <laughs> and Dad wanted to use me as sort of a liaison to, um, let you tell him how the training was going from the GI point of view. But the commanding general found out about that and he said, nope, um, that's not going to work. And so I was assigned to another regiment. Now, was it your plans uh, prior to Pearl that once you graduated that you would go into the service or did, did that prompt you to go? I, yeah. um, I don't know how no. that figured in. I probably figured that with the war I'd have to go in, yeah. and I was drafted uh, October 19th, 43. That's not right. Yes, that's right. And that was after I'd, I'd missed out on a whole semester of school, so I took another whole year of high school at Wichita East, and we went to Wichita because my father's 
mother and my mother's father were still living in Sedgwick County, okay. which is where Wichita is. Mm -hmm. And um, so it just seemed like a quiet, safe place to go. Right. So that last semester of your high school, the chaos of being transferred back to the States and moved around, you, you lost out on, on school. Yeah. Okay. That's right. They, there was no school for anybody until the following April, I, I understand. And of course, we didn't get involved in that. But I've been very close with that high school class. Is that right? We hosted a high school class reunion here in Estes Park and had 45, Carolyn? We had 45. 50 and, total. From, yeah. But the um, majority was, were from Hawaii. But. Um, and the day they arrived, it snowed. Oh boy. September 23rd, <laughs> and they just went wild. <laughs> yeah, that was, but at any rate, um, it, we've been a very close class since then. And as Carol mentioned, we had 45 from that class here for a reunion. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, but that's, that's another story. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, so, so you we'll get back to your uh, in basic down at Fort McClellan. Was that? Uh, mm -hmm. And take your story from well, there. I was finally drafted after. Well, I took a after I graduated from high school. Finally, after the year or semester off, I don't took another whole year, and and then that summer I went to Wichita U for uh, just took a course in in um, freshman comp and in college algebra. And I'll tell you, those two courses on my record opened a lot of doors for me in the service, especially because I got A's in both of them. <laughs> um, okay, so we're, we were evacuated on the 5th of, of March Came back on the Monroe, a beautiful ship, and had a whole bunch of kids my age. And we every night we sat out in the deck, and there were two, two uh, students from Notre Dame, and we sat out until two and three in the morning and sang. Oh wow! Oh, it was great. Um, well, where are we going? Well, okay, so uh, we'll we'll move ahead. Then you you took that those courses at Wichita State, and then and then you, is that when you got drafted? Then no, I didn't get drafted until October nineteenth, forty three. That was when I went into the service um, from Fort McClellan, and. Everybody that I was drafted with went to the Navy, but I said, I want to go to the Army. So they gave me another mental test, and, <laughs> and then I was, uh, oh, oh, didn't make any difference. Um, did a few days uh, in Atlanta, and then back to Fort McClellan, and I told part of that story. Mm -hmm. But being an army brat, I was sort of ahead of the game. And when we graduated from um, basic training, had a graduation parade, and you can guess who was the battalion commander. Sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, from Fort McClellan, I stayed on as cadre there for a time, and had decided previously that I wanted to go into the paratroops. Oh. Why? Very simple, because when my grandchildren asked what I did in the Great War, I wouldn't be embarrassed. My grandchildren never ask. <laughs> I don't think they know there was a war. Yeah. 
So, um, but at any rate, that's why I went to the Veritroops. And um, when I eventually, when was sent overseas to the Philippines to join the 11th Airborne Division, it took us 26 days to cross the Pacific. And somebody goaded me into a smoking a cigar. I've never smoked. But I smoked that cigar, and on the calm Pacific, I was sicker than a dog for three days. <laughs> so I've never smoked. My, my father, incidentally, uh, dad, uh, bet me a five dollars that within a year after I was in the service that I'd be smoking. Well, if I could win five dollars that easily from my father, I was going to do it, so I never did. And the last time I saw him alive, he took me to lunch, and I reminded him of that bet. And I figure that he spent about five dollars for lunch, so yeah. <laughs> We're even. even. <laughs> well, I'd like to back up a little All bit right. uh, and talk about uh, uh, your airborne experience, because that was that was a pretty elite and hard uh, yes, thing to get is. into. Uh, well, how talk a little bit about that training and and getting into the program and the training was very specific and thorough. Uh, as a paratrooper, uh, you uh, we ran through two weeks before we made uh, an actual jump. And um, um, I'm trying to think what all was involved in that training other than running. It seemed that that was about all we did was run. But quite a few people washed out of that program, didn't it? It was, uh, oh, yeah. it was a pretty tough, yeah. from what I understand. But um, I didn't have any real problem with, with it. I was, a, I was a born soldier. And being an army brat, I mm -hmm. guess that's somewhat to be expected. But I was a good soldier. And um, at some point, um, I don't know how it happened, but was asked if I would be interested in going to officer's candidate school, which was my intention from the start, and we did. Is so, that where, once again, your those college courses play, help play into yeah, that? Yeah, that probably did there, but I was thinking more of later on. Okay. So back to Fort Benning we go. Uh, to uh, take, go through jump school. And I took uh, jump master's training in uh, school. And any school that I could. I wasn't eager to go overseas and get shot at. And, in fact, that is a, a very critical statement. I am not a combat veteran. Um, Got over there just after, it was assigned to the 11th Airborne Division, just after they came off of Tagatai Ridge in, on Luzon. And I joined them at Lipa, um, Laguna de Bay. And um, was assigned to A Company of the 187th Regiment of the 11th Airborne Division was a platoon commander. And at that point, the division, the war suddenly came to a, an abrupt atomic halt. And um, we began training for the invasion of Japan. Didn't expect that that would be a lot of fun. Right, certainly. And so I attribute the fact that I'm sitting here talking to you, to the fact that the atomic bomb was dropped and the 
the two of them, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and the war was over. Well, that's one question I always uh, yep. usually ask is, uh, I know there's always been that controversy as to whether we should have dropped them or not, but I think you just gave me your answer to it. I mean, I yep. wouldn't be asking you this question more than likely, because the Japanese, from what I understand, would have fought to the, to the bitter end. It would have uh, it would have been a bloodbath if oh, you guys would have invaded. Yes. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. And <clears throat> we didn't want that, and apparently somebody decided they didn't want it. Now, now, when you first heard about these bombs, could you imagine what this, these things did? Uh, Not you? really. Yeah. It was because they were of such immense proportion, we had nothing to relate it to. Yeah, right, sure. And, um, oh, but I understood that the war was brought to an end because of them, and consequently I attribute the dropping of a bombs um, as the thing that saved my life. Because right. had we had to go in and, and invade Japan, I wouldn't have given two cents for my odds, for the odds right. yeah. that would come out alive. Yeah, you, you wouldn't have been one of the fifth or sixth waves going in. You would have been the first wave going oh, in, behind, way behind yes. enemy lines with as a paratrooper. Uh, I think that is uh, very definitely the case. Had you uh, had the plans developed further enough along where you would have known where you guys were were set to, uh, or what your your part in the invasion was? Had we, as you say, we would have been dropped in first, and, and um, uh, the way they did D Day in Normandy, right? The eighty uh, second and one hundred and first Airborne Divisions. Um, but where, just where, and I, I, I wish I had a map of yeah. Japan yeah. here now. What, what's, what's the island south of Honshu? That probably is where okay. we'd have been dropped. Okay. And, but we weren't. Yeah, right, right. Now, was there, when you guys got word of the, the bombs and the, and the eventual surrender, was there quite a, quite a, a party and celebration? With... No. No? Yeah. No. Because the war was still going on. We didn't know, know that that was going to end it. And we were still preparing to invade Japan. Joseph Swing, Major General, Division Commander. The regimental commander was a colonel by the name of Pearson. And there was another Pearson in our an officer in our regiment. But later I became a company commander. And I think it's interesting to note that the other four battalion other four company commanders in the in the battalion Lyman S. Faulkner was a class of 43, I think. And the other th three company commanders, not counting me, were all, uh, all out of the class of 45. So I was in pretty elite company. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all West Pointers. Wow. I have a brother who graduated in 44. 